Hello, I'm Conrad Stacey. While it's only me you see, my colleague and co-author Dr Michael Byer is on the same wavelength on this topic and he is responsible for much of the critical thinking and most of the detailed analysis. And it was a pleasure putting this project, paper and presentation together with Michael. This talk is about critical velocity. Critical velocity, I'm sure most of you know, is the tunnel airspeed that just prevents backlayering of smoke from a tunnel fire. Critical velocity is very important in jurisdictions which require people to design to achieve it. Where it is required, reference is generally made to the standard NFPA 502. Now what happened recently through the publication of the 2020 version of that standard is that the 502 committee has said that critical velocity is very much higher than they previously said it was. Here is a plot which shows you the 2014 NFPA 502 equation in blue, the 2017 version in red, and the 2020 version in green, along with the equation of Lee, Lay and Ingerson on which the 2020 version is based. If you look at the 50 megawatt fire heat release rate, it has gone up from 2014 by 1.3 metres per second, so more than a 50% increase in critical velocity. What that does, if that's the design fire for your tunnel, is it increases the number of jet fans by a factor of 2.7. And if you were designing, say, a cut and cover tunnel through marshy ground, and you had to put that cut and cover tunnel or significant lengths of it one and a half or two metres deeper to fit in these extra jet fans, then that could be hundreds of millions of dollars or euro extra cost to make that tunnel. Now, you say, well, in the interest of safety, isn't that okay? This is not about safety because the much higher velocities that you get are not necessarily increasing safety. And many jurisdictions try and keep the tunnel airspeed well below critical velocity in any case, as they believe that is a safer outcome. So if we exceed it, then we clearly haven't increased safety. So let's look at the problems with scale models of critical velocity. The NFPA 2020 formula and the Lee, Lay and Ingerson formula that it was built on arose from scale models of critical velocity. In scaling up from those models, only Froude number is used and it's based on a bulk that is a mixed density change in the airflow through the tunnel, not the smoke layer density or a density difference or a density gradient. But what about these other things? Reynolds number, Grashoff number, Nussolt number, etc. In all the different flow regimes, and there's not one flow regime, there's the incoming airflow, there's the flame zone, there's the smoke propagation under the ceiling. They're all very different flow regimes, and so the non-dimensional numbers that are important for each of those will be different. You cannot get them all right, and that fact is well known. Then we have fire intensity. If you have a fire which is very much more intense, then you'd expect the plume to be more energetic and the backlayering propensity to be much higher. So we need to scale the fire intensity. And then there's a the scaling with height, and we will see in subsequent slides that that doesn't work either. First, let's get on to Reynolds number. On the left here, we have a turbulent velocity profile from a small scale tunnel in blue and from a real scale tunnel in red. The small scale tunnel is sized for the 250 millimeter or so tunnel of Lee, Lay and Ingerson. And on the right, we see the detail up close to the ceiling. And you can see that compared to the full-size tunnel, the small-scale tunnel has a significant velocity deficit at the point where it would be addressing the backlayering, where the dynamic pressure of the flow approaching the smoke layer would be important to preventing backlayering. The small-scale tunnels don't scale in the same way with Reynolds number. Now let's look at fire geometry, and hence the fire intensity. It has a very strong influence on the critical velocity. We have two CFD runs here. The top one in each case is with a 20 meter long fire and the bottom one is with a five meter long fire. In both cases, the total heat release rate is 50 megawatts. And we've optimized these for critical velocity. And you can see that there is a very big difference in critical velocity with a different size of fire. In this case, 0.8 meters per second with everything else otherwise the same. If we look more at the fire intensity in this next slide, we can see that the red line there is the memorial tunnel fire intensity. 
four and a half square metres of hydrocarbon pans, giving us 10 megawatts. And the fire intensity scaled using the laws of Lee, Lay and Ingerson for each of their test tunnels is shown as sloping lines there. And so if you're getting up around five times the fire intensity of the memorial tunnel tests, can you really be hoping to reproduce the fire dynamics represented by those tests? And the answer is almost certainly not. So to summarise the scaling from 1 is to 20 models, and that it's 20 plus there because if you're going to memorial tunnel it's probably closer to 30. There is no evidence that the applied simple scaling methods are valid for real tunnel design. There simply hasn't been any evidence produced. There are many known physical reasons that make such scaling vulnerable to error, and I've run through just a few of them previously. So it would be extraordinary if simple scaling could come anywhere near unifying results from tests that differ in scale by a factor of 20. That is, tests where the cross-section is the size of an A4 sheet of paper and the other is a full-size tunnel. If simple scaling did unify such results, it would be a matter of luck, with the competing effects cancelling each other out. When we look at the real data and we find that the scaling simply does not work for tunnel design, we shouldn't be surprised at all. And that is what we see. So I'll take you now to the real data and what started us off in this. I should say what really started us off was that there was such a difference in critical velocity that we had to get into it and find out for our own purposes as tunnel designers what was really going on. But if we look now to the data of Lee, Lay and Ingerson, actually this is just Lee and Ingerson because it was from correspondence sent to the NFPA 502 committee in 2014. This is a plot of their trend and their data, but also shown on it in the plus signs and, and the asterisk signs are the memorial tunnel data with backlayering controlled, which means less than 12 metres backlayering, or backlayering not controlled with the asterisks. And it's pretty clear that those data are well below their trend. And this is the slide with the memorial tunnel data corrected by Lee Lay and Ingerson. So in the context of the first slide I showed, where at least two of the predictions of critical velocity must be wrong, we thought we'd better find out how that correction took place. And we've now done that, and I'll explain it to you. How the correction was done. Here's a quote from the 2010 paper by Lee Lay and Ingerson. That's referring to the backlayering length. But that's not the full story. In fact, a constant 35 and a half metres backlayering correction was applied. So it is true that the average correction was 35 and a half metres, but there was no variation in the correction. It was the same for all data. And it was the same where the backlayering was less than 12 metres or much more than 12 metres. The same correction was applied. But that's not yet the whole story either. Here's the equations from Lee, Lay and Ingerson, and you see that the tunnel height plays a pivotal role. There's an h to the five halves in the heat release rate, and there's a square root of h in the critical velocity. So it's important to both. For critical velocity only, but not for heat release rate, Lee, Lay and Ingerson scaled by the height above the fire pans for the memorial tunnel data. But they used the full tunnel height for the other data they referenced, even if those data had very tall fires. That is not revealed in the paper or in the resulting NFPA material. When tunnel height is used to reproduce the data in Lee, Lay and Ingerson's paper, the assumed backlayering required to achieve the data shift becomes more like 60 metres. The use of the memorial tunnel data to support the trend in fact relies on Lee, Lay and Ingerson's backlayering correction, assuming that the backlayering was 60 metres when they said it was less than 12 metres. There's not in fact any dispute about this, we noticed anomalies and reproduced the calculation ourselves. Of course, we were not the only ones to notice such anomalies. So we reproduced the calculation ourselves. We sent it to Lee and Ingerson, and they checked, amended, and returned with comments our spreadsheet back in March, and this confirmed exactly their treatment of the data. And Ingerson confirmed it recently to the NFPA 502 working group. They shifted the real data to where they were expecting it should be. And if you email us, we will happily share the spreadsheet with you. So what happens if we don't correct the data? Here are the data plotted on a linear scale so that we can see what the effect is in terms of the usefulness to designers and plotted in real units, not non-dimensionalised. And there we see the memorial tunnel data well below the trend. What we've plotted there are the backlayer controlled data with the triangles and then we've got the backlayer controlled data corrected in little circles. 
And you can see it makes of the order of 0.1 metre per second difference when we correct for the backlayering, which wasn't always less than 12 metres, sometimes it was less than 9 or 10 metres, because we know where the fire pans are from the memorial tunnel tests. So there is no way of getting those data by a rational backlayering correction up to the trend of Lee, Lay and Ingerson. And this is where Lee, Lay and Ingerson corrected them by about 1.3 metres per second more than should have been done. Clearly we think that was wrong. So this is where we think the answer really is. We treat the data fairly, we put them on a linear scale with real units, and the best formula yet, critical velocity is 2.7 metres per second. And you can see on this plot, we've added a box there in blue for where the Eureka data may be, because several people reported the Eureka data and there are different versions of it. And that is also not scaled. And the Runehammer data in the red there with the triangles and the circles, as reported by Lonemark, very slightly higher, also not scaled. And it seems that the scaling with height is quite unnecessary. We can say that the critical velocity is close enough 2.7 metres per second for heat release rates above about 10 megawatts for flat tunnels of the sorts of sizes we're interested in. So, where to now for critical velocity? Really, it's a case of back to the future. The 2017 and 2020 versions are affected by the Lee, Lay and Ingerson data correction and NFPA committee's acceptance of that. If we rule those out, we're really back to the 2014 version of the NFPA critical velocity. Or if we really liked this formula and we wanted to find other reasons to sustain the new formula, what might we do? We could do some CFD. And here is a plot of some CFD which we have done we used both FDS in the blue line and Fluent in the green line to explore the influence of tunnel height on critical velocity. These are plots for a 50 megawatt fire. You can see the details below the fire size. The tunnel was 12 meters wide. And up the top there, we have NFPA 2020 and Lee, Lay and Ingerson. And their formula predicts a very strong variation with tunnel height, which is not reflected by either of the CFD versions or by the 2017 or 2014 formula. Now, what's really interesting here is that FDS and Fluent are both CFD approaches to working out the critical velocity, and yet they give enormously different answers. And we know there are problems with how FDS treats the wall function and, and the resulting boundary layers, and it's well known that FDS over predicts critical velocity. So if you want to predict high critical velocities, you can do an FDS model. So if we can't do any CFD to get the answer, we might look back at the memorial tunnel data and wonder whether there's a blockage ratio that in fact increased the real velocity at the extent of the backlayering. And this was a discussion in the NFPA 502 committee about how much blockage there really was. So on the left here, we have a photograph of the early memorial tunnel tests where the false ceiling in the tunnel is still in place. And you can see there's a lot of instrumentation there wrapped in heat shielding and columns which hold the velocity sensors, the pitot probes, also wrapped in heat shielding. And so there's considerable blockage. And you can see on the right there, Dr. Bayer, amongst others, has established what we think that blockage might have been for that photo. Now, the problem here is this. The data which Kyle and Gonzalez used and the data which Lele and Ingerson relied on to support their trend are with the ceiling removed. We do not have a photo of the arrangement or even a sketch with the ceiling removed. But there was nothing to indicate that Kyle and Gonzalez made a mess of the blockage ratio that they looked at in their paper. And so we went back through the Memorial Tunnel report and we found these quotes. With the ceiling in place, there was 130 square feet blockage and we measured pretty much the same with our rough estimate. With the ceiling removed, the comprehensive test report says that the blockage was lower at 110 square feet. So it's apparent that as good experimenters, they got better at packing the equipment in to cause less obstruction and the blockage was reduced when they went and, and refitted the equipment after the removal of the ceiling. The blockage ratio then without the ceiling with the increased cross-sectional area was very much lower than it was in the early tests. And in fact, it matches nicely what Kyle and Gonzalez said the blockage ratio was, which was 17%. Kyle and Gonzalez and all of the data that we've shown you increased the oncoming bulk air velocity by a factor of 1.2 in order to correct for that blockage ratio. So all of the data to date has made an appropriate correction for the blockage ratio that was observed in the real memorial tunnel tests. And there is no justification for further adjustments to be made so what do we conclude from that? 
If we doubled the size, we would expect that the scaling would drift away from reality. If we go up by a factor of 20, it would be very lucky if we found that there was still a good correlation. We know that Lee, Lay and Ingerson corrected the memorial tunnel data to their expected outcome. There wasn't disclosure of that at the time, and no justification has been offered then or now. The real data show that their model experiments and trend differ widely from full-size tunnels. We haven't seen any alternative justification supporting Lee and Ingerson's formula. If it hadn't been adopted by NFPA 502 in the 2020 edition, no one in the industry would have noticed or been bothered about it. But it was, and so we had to look into it. And for an ordinary tunnel, the answer is 2.7 metres per second. Why make it more complicated than that? So that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much for listening. Sorry if it was uh, stressful for you to find out that you now have no basis for the critical velocity which you thought you had a basis for. But I think it's really important to get these things correct on the scientific record because it is such a big influence on the design and the cost and the safety of the road tunnels we all build. Thank you.